really want to first introduce Heather Cleary from uh, CEO of Peninsula Family Service and Evan Jones, the executive director of the uh, Boys and Girls Club of Mid Peninsula, who are going to be facilitating this uh, session and who are our partners for this peer learning series. Um, so I just want to review quickly the goals of the peer learning series. We'd like to provide a space for, for providers to share effective pra practices and to learn from peers, from experts in the field, and from those investing in the work via government and philanthropy, to strengthen the ties between providers and school districts, to build the learning hub provider community and supporting those that wish to create and expand hubs, um, support to providers as they prefer for summer programs, facilitate dialogue on equity issues, and centralize existing data and identify new sources of data on mitigating learning loss. So we have a fantastic program and at the very end we have a special treat um, from fit kids so i hope you can all stay to the very end we're also going to be sending out a survey at the end to make sure that we find out from you exactly if you like the session but also what we should be doing for uh sessions coming up so with that i'm going to turn it over to heather and evan Thank you so much, Petra. And we're really, really excited to have our guests from um, the Marin County School District and also from Marin Promise. Um, and they're gonna talk to us a little bit about successful partnerships between out-of-school providers and, and um, schools. And so for those of you who didn't get to do your homework, Marin Promise was founded in 2012 with a very simple goal of um, closing the achievement gap in Marin. Um, and so their goal is to do that by 2028. Um, they had very successful learning hubs, um, similar to what we've done in the county, um, but we're really inviting them here to talk about the partnership between the um, 100 plus nonprofits that make up Marin Promise and the school district and how they've had such great um, collaboration and communication. Um, so Without further ado, because I'm boring, I will turn it over to um, the folks from Marin County, uh, County Office of Ed and Marin Promise. Great, thank you so much for including us today. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Um, Marin County Office of Education and Marin Promise Partnership played a couple of different roles in the Learning Hub work in Marin County. The team from Marin COE coordinated community-based organizations and districts around the opening and operating and funding of Marin Community Learning Hubs. While our colleagues from Marin Promise Partnership supported community-based organization and district connection through data collection and networking opportunities. The Marin COE supports 18 school districts serving over 30,000 students. And in addition to tiny rural and larger suburban settings, district and school populations vary, some having 70 to 90% students qualifying for free and reduced price lunch services. Across Marin, there are about 9,000 students who qualify for FRL, that's our free and reduced price lunch services. In spring of 2020, exclusive learning pods started forming. And so in response, the MCOE team created an essential question over the summer. How do we meet the most urgent needs of our most vulnerable learners during a time of online learning? Our answer was learning hubs, which we defined as a safe space with in-person adult supervision and access to Wi-Fi during school hours. This was not a replacement for school, just a temporary bridge until students were back to attending school in person. While our team led a coordinated effort to open learning hubs for this specific purpose, other schools and organizations in Marin also ran learning hubs during this time. And in addition to qualifying for free and reduced price lunch services, there was additional criteria used to prioritize students most in need. It was a collaborative effort between operators, the MCO team, and school districts. So we identified specific student need using, a, using Google Form interest surveys that were distributed through the school districts, community-based organizations, our website, and social media. We also worked with school community liaisons, principals, and district staff to identify students most in need, um, including personal outreach to families and flyers at school lunch and food pantry pickup sites. Um, the Marin COE's role was not in operating learning hubs. 
So our roles were to connect and coordinate resources. So we connect and coordinated organizations with staff available, with organizations who had empty space, with students in need, and then coordinated funding to reimburse eligible operating costs. Um, second, we removed barriers to connect eligible students in need to learning hubs. So we connected eligible families to learning hub operators and sites directly, as well as facilitated relationships between families, operators, school community liaisons, principals, and teachers. Um, we supported operators and made sure they had what they needed to get things done. Um, we also supported operators in adherence to safety protocols and procedures, including serving as their connection to public health. And then finally, um, one of our roles was just being good stewards of the money we re received and reallocated to support this initiative. So our goal was to have one learning hub open on September 8, 2020. And by mid-October, we were working with a total of seven learning hub operators at 17 locations serving about 440 students in 2K through 8th grade. In January, with the help of new funding from Marin Community Foundation, we were able to extend and expand Marin Community Learning Hubs to provide more than 600 students in TK to fifth grade and 200 students in sixth to 12th grade with Learning Hub access. And during this time, Marin Promise Partnership launched a Learning Hubs Network group. Over 30 partners contributed and collaborated in a variety of ways. Some operators expanded their partnerships beyond the original purpose of learning hubs. Uh, one example that we wanted to share was the YMCA and San Francisco um, Rand Food Bank partnered to provide additional snacks for all students in the elementary hubs in San Rafael. Every week, YMCA volunteers received individually bagged and delivered snacks to about 460 students at eight different learning hub locations, even locations the YMCA was not operating. And so we were able to start this initiative because of a $200,000 donation from Bank of Marin last summer. Um, and then in addition, the Marin Education Equity Collaboration Group raised about $24,000. Then in December, the Marin COE received new funding from Marin Community Foundation, allowing us to expand in middle school and then bridging to high school. And um, we also redirected about $600,000 of Marin COE internal funding, including foster youth, homeless, and P3, which is preschool through third grade grant funding. Um, those numbers don't include the funding that was contributed by school districts and operators. So we collaborated with some districts to utilize um, CARES Act, ACEs, and other funding to subsidize learning hub costs. And then many learning hubs operators also utilized internal funding or donations to cover additional expenses. And then with the support of funding partners, um, Marin COE allocated about $1.2 million for learning hub operating expenses. Um, which lasted for about six months. Um, we grappled with several challenges uh, during this process. So many supporters approached us with ideas for providing additional student supports under the umbrella of learning hubs, including virtual tutoring and mindfulness work. Um, and many ideas were wonderful. We would have loved to explore them, but our ability to coordinate learning hub support for over 800 um, children with a very small team was due to maintaining a really focused purpose, which was to connect students to distance learning. Um, we weren't able to serve all the students in need due to staffing limit, limitations, excuse me. So uh, we prioritized keeping available spaces filled. So operators utilized existing and furloughed staff, um, as well as hired to fill in gaps. And then uh, real-time communication between operators, schools, and families was really what ensured that registered students were consistently attending learning hubs and that any open spots were filled ASAP. Um, some operators in schools used existing systems like ARIES to track um, and communicate about learning hubs attendance. But for those in need of a structure to support communication, Marin Promise Partnership developed a data tracker. Um, and then another challenge for us was working with a finite amount of funding for an operation that was ever expanding, ever evolving, and with an uncertain timeline. And so because of that, um, our team was able to provide funding award updates to operators on a month to month basis or less. Um, but overall, um, you know, the process that we developed to coordinate hubs and distribute funds and support operators grew organically. Um, the learning hubs have closed or evolved as schools resumed in person learning and because about 85% of Marin schools are open for full time in person learning right now. 
Um, in addition to the number of students uh, that were able to gain adequate access to distance learning through Learning Hubs, another real bright spot was the reimagined strength and partnerships amongst the community-based organizations and school districts, as well as our county office of ed. Um, and so Michael and Shelley are going to share a little bit more about that and their role in supporting that work. Yeah, thanks, uh, Amanda and Tanya. Um, my name is Michael Lift. I'm the Director of Technology at Ren Promise Partnership, and we are a community collaborative throughout the county, and that means we bring together individuals, organizations, school districts, um, government uh, um, entities and people together to ensure that they are aligned around um, common goals and we ensure accountability and all the things that a community collaborative would, would do. Um, can we maybe go to the next slide there? And I'm anticipating that people on this call are gonna have a lot of questions. So feel free to just, you know, I only have a few slides before I turn it over to Shelly. Uh, just feel free to stop me and ask any questions if you have any, because um, I think it, uh, there, there's a lot to what we did. So, um, MCOE um, started supporting some hubs and there were other hubs that started to spring up as well. So we, we sort of try to take a global view of tracking like where all these hubs were, what kind of students were there, um, were they needs-based. Um, and then the, I created the attendance tracker and this um, not only tracked attendance, but it tracks, and it's still being used today, actually. It tracks um, what what sort of issues are coming up for students and their engage, level of engagement. So it's sort of an attendance tracker plus, if you will. Um, and you can see the numbers here. So we have 17 of the 55 hubs using it, um, almost 400 kids, and there's almost 20,000 records in there now. And so uh, maybe we can go to the next slide. I can go into the database itself. Or actually, this is a good slide. So this, this shows that um, the hubs themselves are on the right and they're entering data into a database, which I'll show you in a minute, um, screenshots at least, using Airtable and some web pages that I developed. And basically the hubs enter in their daily tra attendance tracking and then that data is available for um, schools and counselors and other anybody who should be looking at that data, but primarily schools, um, which is, it's a great shared database allowing um, schools to get real-time access. And I think it's one of the issues that we were hoping to avoid was students going to hubs and their counselors and, and, and other school officials really didn't know what was going on. So this, this allows them to keep track of it. And also, it really didn't matter if, if a student was at a hub that happened to be in one location that had students who normally would go to different schools. So our system um, allowed um, to route any student um, roster and, and their attendance um, to, the, to the school that they actually are um, going to normally. So if you can go to the next slide. Hey, hey Mark. Michael, did the data flow the other direction from the schools to the hubs as well? Was that part of the? No, it did not. And I think part of that had to do with, um, you know, we we had mandate to get data to go from uh, the hubs to the schools and uh, to Marin County Office of Education as well to just make sure that the students were, were showing up. Um, but I think that connection between the counselor, um, just by virtue of having that information there, allowed the school to maybe get in touch with the teacher or the student themselves um, through whatever channels that they had. But we don't have we don't have anything in place to push it back. And I think part of that has to do with some privacy issues, privacy issues as well. Yeah. Um, okay. A quick follow-up, you said that counselor, so each school had like a, a point person for the, the attendance or is that how? Yeah, and I'll show you in a minute here. Um, maybe let me walk through that and I'll, and I'll catch that question. So here's a, a look at the, it's, it's a web page 
and it's actually it, it normally is stacked on top of each other um, and there's a place to put student roster information so that they can enter in you know not just the name but ethnicity what school they go to grade level etc um, and then each day they can track attendance and there's a feature in here too because we we did get some feedback from hubs that say well i have 25 kids and i can't hand enter in every single one so i created a bulk submit option to say okay just mark the ones that were absent or had any kind of issue or something like that or something come up or even bright spots and then you can push a button to to enter in the rest of the students that day and you could see down the the the, the green red I color coded them so you can you can easily see oh the red ones are absent and you know the other ones had varying levels of participation level that day. Maybe go to the next slide. Okay, this is um, kind of answering your question, Evan. Each um, so I have, a, I have a web page and at the very top of it, um, the county office can see all of the student records and this um and then each school district would then have the ability to see their own data and each is password protected so they can see the student roster and then they can also see the attendance for that um for that week and using this Airtable tool uh, you can go back and forth and you can you can see a history on that um so hopefully that answers your question but each school had the ability to get their data. And what I did is I'd sent emails out to the counselors and to the school officials, uh, super um, uh, principals, vice principals, and saying, hey, you can access your students' data if you need to. Maybe we can go to the next slide here. Yeah. And this one, I, I redacted some of it so you wouldn't see the student names. But this gives you a view into what it looks like if you drill down so that if you're, for example, a counselor, you can see, oh, my student that I'm working with, this is, he or she has gone to school on these days. And then if you see just off to the right there, you can see there's two columns of student needs. And, and actually we saw a lot of usage around this, um, which I think was, for me personally in developing this system was one of the, the bright spots that they could actually capture notes on like what's really happening for that student and actually if you go to the next slide i think that might be my last one yeah this one um it's really great because it captures um some of the feedback that we got on the left there from counselors saying how much they appreciate using this and then on the right hand side those are just some examples of um, how student needs were addressed. So the hub uh, administrator would say, hey, they need extra support, so first year student, and then um, what, what, I, what steps were taken during that process. I do see some questions in the chat. I don't know if people want to, yeah. How did you track student engagement? Hopefully that one got answered, but that was a simple drop down that said, you know, uh, they, were, they were here, but they, you know, they were distracted or, you know, there's different ways that they could um, categorize their interaction that day or that level of activity and then capture any issues in a free text. Um, okay. How are CBOs recruited, vetted, and selected? Um, I don't know, Amanda, if you wanted to. I can, yeah, I can help them. So a variety of ways. I think that, you know, some of the CBOs, um, like Marine Free Libraries, have been have been working um, with the Marin COE on pop up child care and some other components. Some of the CBOs had existing um, after school relationships with school districts like Bay Area Community Resources or YMCA. Um, you know, some CBOs reached out to us to offer staff or space. Um, and then we basically um, also reached out to CBOs based on the geographic areas where the the students uh, where the needs were. So when we um, got those interest survey results or uh, result, you know, information from schools or districts around students who needed learning hub support, um, then we looked in those kind of neighborhoods or areas for potential space um, or potential organizations who might be able to serve them. 
And Amanda, did you want to add, can I add about the application process as well? And so then um, CBOs were asked that were interested in operating learning hubs were asked to apply for the funding. And there was certain criteria that needed to be met. And so those were um, reviewed by the learning hub team here at the County Office of Ed and then um, selected um, based on that they met the eligibility criteria for funding. I'll just I got another another question on um, data trends. So, so the only other um, I was going to jump in. Hi, I'm Shelley Hamilton from Marine Promise Partnership. One of the interesting trends um, that will lead into uh, you know I'm going to wrap up a little bit, and I was glad to hear that this is a group of folk, a group of organizations that are looking at um, both the learning hubs, um, but and also the summer, and many of you are before and after care. So one of the trends that we saw um, later on in the development was as schools started um, opening uh, in hybrid, there was some shifting around. There've been several different shifting around. There was some shifting around of students in hubs, moving from one hub to another hub. And Tanya, I don't know if you can talk about that, but I remember there was a moment in time where we were all working together, we're in Promise Partnership and the County Office of Education doing tracking and noticing that the needs geographically were shifting because students wanted to go to a hub on closer to the school that they were attending when they started attending in person. So that was one of the data trends uh, that we saw in terms of attendance and registration and where students were attending. So that there was this um, kind of dance between attendance at a hub and where districts were in terms of their reopening process, which made for an interesting ongoing, ever evolving <laughs> uh, enrollment process. So, and then I-, I It sounds like- about, Yep. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Chelsea. I just have a couple more si slides in terms of another evolution um, that we're looking at right now that we're in the middle of that also might be interesting uh, that we thought we'd share with you in terms of the learning hubs. I don't know if you wanna go to the next slide, but really noticing that as, as schools were starting to even move further and further into in-person instruction and the learning hub schedules and attendance was shifting and school districts and partners we're starting to think about their summer programs. There was another conversation and we had started Rain Promise Partnership as was mentioned earlier, was convening this network of providers um, and school districts and that we wanted to take what we had learned from the learning hubs in terms of the relationships that we're developing both through interacting with the data, but then layering on top of that, the regular monthly meetings that we were having as part of our peer learning and um, development process of bringing all the providers and the schools together um, in terms of this broader concept of how do we create this expanded learning opportunities, the inside of the classroom and outside the classroom beyond just the learning hubs, which we're continuing on, but to take those relationships as they were tightening and move them into planning for the summer so that the summer would be planned and coordinated in a very different way. Because for example, one of the stories that we heard was the YMCA who had been a before and after care and the kids would just come over we're now working integrally with teachers during the learning hubs on curriculum and understanding what the teachers were teaching and what curriculum they were using. So they got much more connected and involved from a curriculum basis. And that was something that we're thinking, okay, that could also transition into the summer as the summer and you can, uh, was looking at helping students uh, recover from the impact of COVID and, and looking at summer in a different way. Um, and as many of you have heard, this idea of expanded learning opportunities was coming up in news articles. There was research and policy institutes like the Learning Policy Institute that was making recommendations. Um, a lot of the CARES Act funding um, and the recovery funding was specifically naming expanded learning opportunities and specifically naming uh, learning hubs in summer. So that was the larger ecosystem of how do we create, and you can go on to the next slide. So this was kind of, again, the, the evolution of how the learning hubs um, are still continuing, but um, going on in, in, because it's all the same service providers or, or many of the same service providers, the child care centers, the YMCAs, the libraries that also then do before and after care and do summer programs. So since we had already started convening that group of, of programs, we added in additional um, operators who were working on summer programs and then continued on that relationship and have now continued those learning conversations into summer planning and have really seen a lot of that relationship that was developed during learning hubs be very fruitful in organizations working together uh, for planning for the summer. 
So if you want to go on to the next, and then we're hoping it will then again translate into the fall so that when students are back on campus in person and back in their before and after care or their intercession programs that that relationship will continue to strengthen and so that the curriculum and what students are doing in class will show up in aftercare and that the aftercare people on campuses or nearby will have a better relationship with teachers um, and again the purpose and the goals between um, the learning hubs and the overall um, expanded learning opportunities we know that the the need is greater because of covid this idea of having practice shifts to looking at equity and that the programs and services are meeting the need, um, building in these accountability systems that are cross-sector accountability systems, because we know schools have their data systems and after-school programs have their data systems. So how can we build in that shared population level accountability for the entire system? And then really looking at working together in new ways as an integrated support system. So if you want to go on to the last slide, and then we'll do more questions. So we've really looked at also building in families. So it's not just service providers in schools, but then how can we integrate families and family advocates and community advocates and student voice, both into the programming of the summer opportunities, as well as how students are placed in those programs. So for example, one of the examples given is that students were, were um, referred into learning hubs because the teachers would say, hey, I've got a family and the student hasn't been showing up and they really need support. So then they would help communicate that to the school and then the school would connect them with the learning hub. So we want to, so we're talking with the providers about a similar process for summer. So it's not just an open call, hey, register your kid for your summer program, but that students are actually having a referral system and a coordinated system. So we're seeing programs coordinate like, oh, I'll do my program in the morning and you do your program in the afternoon so that the kids that get referred into them can be going to both programs. Or instead of all of us doing our programs in June, let's stagger them. So you do three weeks and then there'll be another three weeks of a different program and another three weeks of a different program. So we're seeing that kind of coordination take place and then also coordinating working with a lot of the family advocates. So building in that third leg of the integrated system. So I will stop there and we can go into some of the questions. Let's see, uh, more about the experience of YMC and relationships and communications with teachers. Right, so actually we had in one of our conversations where we had school districts and the partners together, um, there was an example given where teachers were actually, when a learning hub was on site, on a school site, uh, teachers were actually, um, during maybe a prep period, they would come and find the student in the learning hub to maybe do a one-on-one -on -one session with a student who needed some additional help. There was a lot more communication between the, um, between the learning hub operators and the principals around um, the curriculum that they were using for reading and so that they would understand they were using Fontes and Pinnell and what does it mean when you say a kid is at level reading G so that then they could help the students in the learning hubs understand what level reading they're at or choose the right books in the library. So there was a lot more conversation between the learning hub operators and the schools with respect to curriculum and understanding students and as Michael mentioned too there was also the data sharing between, well, why is a kid, is a kid showing up at the learning hub but not showing up in class? Or are they showing up in class and not showing up in the learning hub? So was, there was a lot more of that communication as well to have a, a more robust, full picture of what's going on in a student's life because all of the people who are working with the same students um, are communicating. Well, I know we have more questions and we might have to shoot some emails. Um, we have to move on to our next presenter, but really thank you to the folks at Marin Promise Partnership and Marin County Office of Education. And it sounds like a great um, archetype for us to try to um, duplicate here in San Mateo County. Um, thank you guys so much for the presentation and for the great work you're doing for the kids. That's, it's really about the kids. I'm gonna turn it over to um, Heather Cleary so she can introduce our next speaker. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Evan. It is my pleasure to introduce Nancy McGee today, who is our San Mateo County Superintendent of Schools, elected in 2018. Superintendent McGee brings more than 20 years of classroom experience and 11 years of district and county office education leadership experience to the role. 
She also serves on the first five San Mateo County Commission, the Housing Endowment and Regional Trust of San Mateo County, uh, Home for All, the Big Lift Leadership Team, and is a co-chair of the San Mateo County Child Care Partnership Council. And she is going to speak today on the relationship between schools and out of off, out of school providers. Superintendent McGee, thank you. Thank you, Heather. Um, it's really nice to be here. Thank you to Thrive for putting on this important conversation. And uh, um, it's a pleasure to see many of you who I see around around town. Um, Rod, uh, really nice to see you. Miss you. Um, so, you know, following uh, um, a, a, a presentation like um, Marin Promise is a tough act. Um, I think, uh, you know, San Mateo County, I know I have a lot of uh, light behind me, but San Mateo County doesn't really have the level of coordination and collective impact in this particular slot of after school care and schools. Um, Marin, I know um, Mary Jane Burke, the county superintendent there very well. Um, she's, she's a mentor and she talks about, um, I know she's been in her role for more than 20 years um, and really knows the county well. Now, Marin is uh, smaller, has fewer small district, districts than um, San Mateo County, which makes it a little bit uh, more of a sizable chunk you can take on, although all of this coordination and integration is really challenging. But um, we have in San Mateo County many examples of this kind of collective impact coordination alignment and resources just in other spaces. And I think the one program that people know the best is the big lift, right? This is what we're doing with the big lift, and it's around early learning, um, high quality preschool. It involves many different elements and many different partners, um, uh, support from the County Office of Education, support from uh, the county government. And so um, that's one of our collective uh, impact programs. And I just wanna be really upfront that we, at the San Mateo County Office of Education, we haven't yet taken on collective impact around after school care. Um, and, and so this Mer the Marin Promise program gives us a great model to emulate. Um, one thing I do get concerned about is just bandwidth and capacity. You know, we're um, deeply invested in the um, collective impact of the big lift. We have a coalition for safe, safe schools and communities, which is around safe school protocols with law enforcement, the health um, agencies, behavioral health, um, probation, all those different partners. And we invest a lot of time and resources in that space. And we also are invested in a collective impact work around environmental literacy. Um, so there, it's, there's no doubt that we, we can do collective impact work. Um, but it does take, I, I don't know, you know, I missed the beginning of your presentation. I'm sorry about like the history of how long this really took to coalesce, pull the partners in. Um, can I ask you that question? Just how far into the world, you know, into this work you are? I was just going to say, I think I would second your um information just about how much collective impact does take. It, it, it does take a lot of both convening, relationship building time. Um, and because Marin Promise Partnership had already had an existing partnership of all of the nonprofit providers that were providing before and after care and tutoring. And mm -hmm. so that was it, that had been existing for five years plus the long history with Marin County Office of Education. So there was that history to build off of in that way, you're right. Right. And but but what I love is that you have a model right in this space. And so we don't I think what San Mateo County is really working hard to figure out and and COVID crashed it down on our heads. Right. Is that we have all these ways in which we need to serve students and families 
outside of the, you know, the eight to three o'clock space of the school day. And we don't really have extensive coordinating systems to do that. And so I have come to this conversation before to affirm that um, there really is a moat around school districts. Like they build their protective layers and they do it for a reason because it's all about capacity and focus and they can't, they don't have the space, the, the staffing and the energy to vet every single idea, every single program and take up every single dollar that comes their way. So when you have a coordinated structure like Marin Promise, it, it gives a safe space for people to come forward and plug in. And so the value of this is immeasurable, right? It's um, how, and I would point all of our local partners into, um, let's start mapping out what this looks like and where we are in San Mateo County and how, what our next steps might be to be getting closer to building something similar. Um, Right now in San Mateo County, what I've seen is just really strong partnerships between individual school districts and their local community partners, right? Ravenswood School District completely relied on the Boys and Girls Club to run their learning hubs. Um, and in partnership, the district folded in the Boys and Girls Club staff with resources that helped promote their safety and health. So we included, when we accomplished, you know, more than 11,000 vaccinations for the education workforce, we work with the superintendents to include every adult working in person with a student um, under a partnership or under the auspices of the school district. So all of the Boys and Girls Club staff got included in our priority vaccinations. Um, and, and, you know, that was a nice uh, simpatico moment that we could also, they, the Boys and Girls Clubs really leaned in with many of our districts. Um, we have other partners, of course, also, but, um, but to build them into something we were doing sort of on a mass scale felt good, right, just as a human being. Um, I also also want to call out like on the coast side in the rural part of our county, which is much more separated uh, geographically from the rest of our districts, La Honda Pescadero Unified relies on its community partner Puente. They are all, they're so connected um, that they almost operate as a single entity. Um, and so again, that relationship between Puente, um, very local, um, culturally um, relevant way of serving that community. Um, because, the, because the coast site is so small and isolated and the district is also small, they are able to build this really, really, clear partnership. But I think there's something to learn from what they do, right? Um, and how they operate and how they work back and forth together. Um, you know, uh, I just really feel like all of our, when even when I felt like the learning hubs were sort of solved, um, but we had some ph philanthropic partners come forward Catholic Charities who said, you know, we've done a lot of work in Marin. We've done a lot of work in San Francisco, but and Marin, I mean, uh, San Mateo is part of our uh, footprint, but we're really not doing any work there. This was only like February of 2021. And from my seat, I thought, well, I think everybody's kind of got their learning hubs going um, and staffed and things, but I put it out to the superintendents and lo and behold, several came forward like, oh my goodness, this is, we need this so badly. So got them partnered up. And, um, and so 
while school districts have their moats around them, they also have their needs. And sometimes they don't know where's the appropriate place to go to for expressing their needs or how to find the right partner. So in that way, um, the County Office of Education does serve as a throughway for matching. Um, in fact, um, I think Catholic Charities came from a recommendation from Rod Chow, who's on this call, and um, some of the Board of Supervisors. So um, what we have right now is a very loose, casual, open-hearted uh, like tenor to the work, but we don't really have any staff dedicated to sort of the after-school coordination. Um, and we don't have a, a community um, organ, you know, a community structure to plug in. So I would argue that, especially looking ahead at what COVID has taught us, number one, taking those lessons forward in a really meaningful way, um, sort of really shines a light on this gap that we have right now in San Mateo County that we just haven't had the impetus to act on. Um, and all the work that's been done, I will say, over the course of the year under COVID to make progress in this space has been done by, by the community-based organizations. Um, it's not the county office leading at the front, you know, it's um, we're trying our best to circle back and support, but it's a, it's all of you who are really pushing um, the envelope in the innovation space on this, and that's a really important role that you're playing, because um, obviously under COVID, taking on a new project just wasn't possible. So what we were able to do was hear concerns and listen to the conversations and figure out we can do a little bit here, we can support here, we can write a letter here, we can get some money here. Um, uh, but we were not able to take the leadership space. So hats off to everyone on this call who I know, um, and I know that the Board of Supervisors have spent quite a bit of time and energy trying to be responsive to the needs of families and their communities and the community-based organizations, because there's not that, if you think about as a metaphor, what we don't have is that really fancy extension cord with all the slots where you can plug in, you know, 15 different cords and it doesn't blow everything up. Like we just don't have that plug in um, to the system and then go, but it isn't, it's okay to be aware that that's there and that need is there. It's also okay to take what we've learned from this work. And there's a lot of learning that's been happening through the learning hubs and all those back and forth conversations that um, I haven't even really been able to download all that learning yet and hear about what went well, what didn't go well, you know. So we have a lot of debrief to do, but. Um, you know, I'm here today to speak to, first of all, to thank all of you for all the work you're doing, to certainly admire and praise Marin Promise for all of that beautiful model that it provides to us, knowing how much time and work and energy it took to get to that place, and, um, and acknowledging that this is a space for us to move in in San Mateo County. And um, again, the County Office of Education wants to be part of that. Um, how do we lead it? I'm not sure. You know, it's the community partners that know where, I think better where to start. And we can possibly pull in the district partners to really make that, that plug-in fit for everybody. Um, 
So I'm happy to take, I'm, you know, throwing out that idea, but uh, happy to take questions or thoughts or turn it back over to you, Heather, for the rest of the program. Thank you, Nancy. I uh, really appreciate your comments and especially around not yet uh, the collective impact around out of school care because We've got a whole bunch of people on this Zoom today that are very interested in moving this forward. And that is one of the first steps because we do have a lot of community assets and a lot of great examples. I think we are gonna move along on our agenda today. We have a panel discussion to discuss uh, school and out of school provider relationships in the county. Uh, we've got Amanda Goal, the assistant principal at Foster City Elementary School, Ellen Kraska, assistant principal at Laurel Elementary School in Menlo Park, and Flora Espinal, family engagement coordinator at Laurel Elementary School. And you are all working with the same after school provider, the Newton Center and have had positive experiences during this last year. And we'd love for each of you to start, um, tell us a little about your role at the school and your perspective in working with Newton. Amanda, do you wanna start? Sure, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see all of you and, and connect with some people that I don't know. Um, as was mentioned, I am the assistant principal here at Foster City Elementary School. Uh, this year, I also um, assisted our school district in um, partnering with Newton to bring in after school, excuse me, learning hubs to our school district. Um, we Newton has worked in our school district before, and so we had partnered with them. And then they pivoted to be able to provide learning hubs during this um, COVID pandemic that we have going on. And so currently uh, to date, we will have 18 learning hubs provided by Newton. We also have um, hubs that are provided from our uh, school district personnel, but it did become a thing where we needed to have more people to provide the support for the students that were in need. So that's a little bit of a background. Did you want me to talk any more about that or? I'm sure we can come back with the Okay. <laughs> Let's move on to Ellen, thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Ellen Kraska and I am the assistant principal at Laurel School here in Menlo Park in Atherton. And I just wanted to thank the Marin Promise group. I really enjoyed hearing about how you creatively solved the attendance and engagement piece um, with that amazing data dashboard that was inspirational. That was something that I remember looking through um, how we're gonna work through that attendance and engagement piece. So I really appreciated that piece. Um, I am proud to share a little bit about my experience working with Newton as a partner, as an assistant principal at the school here. And it was really my job to make sure that we had facilities and spaces and desks. And as you saw in some of the pictures, those um, study carols for our students and everything they needed when they came to our learning hubs in our school so that they could continue learning um, in this unique experience and pandemic. Um, not only when we started the school year during the distance learning time, but also as the Marin folks shared around when there was those shifts to hybrid blended learning models, thinking about A weeks on and B weeks off and for our kindergartners when they were doing half days, et cetera. Um, and then also for some of our first graders when they would just have after school care needs. So that was a little bit about my experience and perspective and I'm happy to be here to share. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Floor, can you share your experience, please? Hi. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Wu. I've been enjoying this whole presentation. I cannot stay long. I have to start with that. I have another meeting. But my experience has been great with uh, communication with Newton. Like Ellen was saying that she's uh, like overseeing, um, placing the kids AB week, AB week after school and all that. And uh, the piece that I'm doing is like connecting the families, doing registration and making sure that all families that need aftercare because they're going back to work and or the kids are not connecting. So it's a communication, an ongoing communication between staff at the school district with Newton and, um, and I do the piece with the parents, um, when, uh, especially when um, 
language is a barrier. So it's been great working with Newton. That's wonderful. Thank you, Flor. And since you do have a few more minutes with us, I'm going to direct my next question to you uh, because it's wonderful to see family engagement at a school district. Um, how do you actually pull in family engagement to the programming between the school and then the after school provider? So for me, it has been like a direct. Um, it has been a direct uh, communication between uh, with the teachers and the parents. I do have a, a very close relationship with the parents and if they need that um, aftercare or they are like struggling because of they're not connecting. So they would go and text me or call me and, um, and we find the solutions and we ended up enrolling them in Newton. So it's, it's, been, it's been great, especially when parents are like on and off from work um, you know, that structure and stability for the kids is very important and uh, um, teachers do understand the struggles that family have and um, Newton understands the same um, and uh, works for these uh, families and does, they do everything that they can to uh, provide the, uh, what they need. And in, in this case, it, they needed the place and the people that to, um, to guide them and, and keep them engaged in school. So I do the family part and they do the school and we all work together. That is such a wonderful partnership and you can really tell how that critical relationship building is the key element to it. Do, does Newton adjust their curriculum based on the child's needs? Um, what uh, what we have been doing it Newton has uh, um, they had all this program like all thought about it so they have like an email account and the school connects with the email with the uh, teacher that they have in the cohort so they had access to all the information that they had at the of their schedule and Ellen can tell you more about that um, and they just follow what the teachers um, are asking them to do. So they don't adjust, they just try to help them to be connected and to follow their program. Sounds like wonderful coordination. Ellen, do you wanna add a little more to that? Sure. Very early on in the process when we were sharing at home learning, distance learning plans and resources and uh, all um, students to get onto, Newton reached out to us and said, can you just include us on all of those emails and so that we are a part of getting the communication and we can set up the schedules for your students. And very early on in the process, they did that and they just took that on and it was tremendous with Tall and his team, how they made sure that our students were able to access the learning from the learning hub and those classroom spaces. They had, if you could see in the classrooms, whiteboards filled with schedules for all the different students. Um, and their team was fantastic at making sure kids could access it at home and, and um, in the at-home learning hub. Wonderful. Amanda, do you have anything to add from uh, the Foster City School? Yeah, so um, I think that one of the, the reasons that the partnership is so strong is again, the relationship and the communication. And when we brought them in to partner, not just my school, but across schools um, in our school district, they had everything kind of figured out and they had thought it through. Um, they're very open to feedback administrator, but then also someone that's supporting learning hubs across the district. Like, you know, it's been said I'm kind of busy and I do have other things to do and kids and meetings. And so I think that it was just really um, refreshing and um, supportive to work with somebody that had kind of thought about all of these things and was willing to partner and pivot because as a site administrator and a site leader, when you're taking more 
people onto your site every day, it becomes, am I managing them or are they partnering with me? Who am I coordinating with? And something that was really powerful is that they bring a site manager or site uh, coordinator to the, the school where the kids are. So they are kind of in charge of it and they coordinate with all the families and the teachers and the children. So it doesn't become something else that um, I'm doing that isn't necessarily, I don't necessarily have time to do. And that's a big thing when you're thinking about being efficient with your time and everything. Yeah, bringing solutions to the table is certainly important. Now, as you were uh, getting the learning hub set up, what were your challenges around? Oh, I did didn't you notice any? Um, well, you know? we worked on, uh, yes, there is definitely a digital divide. I will say that. I think that um, what we found is a lot of the students that came to our learning hub did not necessarily have reliable access to internet at home and they needed a, a stable place. And we also made sure that all of our students had um, their Chromebooks and their headphones, but every every detail was thought out, right? So before Tal and his team came onto site, they let me know the things that they would need. And it wasn't something that it was a day of, I'm running around trying to make sure that it's all set up. Um, it was, we need our headphones. Amanda, I said, okay, okay, I'm gonna get them to you. Um, and so the, our students are using Chromebooks and then we have headphones that are provided for them here on site. Okay, great, thank you. Flora, Ellen, anything around the technology for your families? I think one of the pieces that I could chime in about is similar to what Amanda said, is that we found that our families needed reliable Wi-Fi access so that they could access the lessons. And so having students come to the um, learning hub so that they could be in those classes was was very valuable. It was, I see some people on this call have headphones and microphones and there's a lot of space, but if you can think about a classroom with kids sitting six feet apart, noise becomes a big issue. So noise canceling headphones with microphones were very, very important for our students so that they could, um, their teachers would able, be able to hear them and filter out the classroom kind of noise um, and just have that microphone so that they could hear the students clearly. So noise canceling headphones was a huge um, piece with really good microphones that we used throughout. So one thing that I wanted to share is that not only that internet connection that of course it's it's a it was a big uh, uh, one of the biggest reasons why we were we wanted the kids in because we had hotspots but the hotspots are not enough to connect but the other uh, the other reason that I found that it was like very important for us to bring our kids was um, our parents don't know how to help them connect to a Zoom call. The internet falls or the connection doesn't work and the Zoom, this is not the Zoom. So that itself, maybe the, the student wants to be there but can't connect, don't have anybody around that can help. It's only grandma or the aunt or they're, you know, they're like multitasking, doing whatever they can and, uh, having this opportunity to bring them in with the scholarships or partial scholarships or whatever it is, um, it was a key for these kids to be connected and participate in the classes. So that's why it was so important for us to, to help them be connected this way. And it, it is like, I just can't tell you enough about what Newton has done with, uh, uh, with our students and how happy we are. Fantastic. Now, what are the plans going forward as districts reopen and summer begins? That's the question everybody wants to know. Um, so I'm going to, I would just say that at least our plan moving forward, and I want to also acknowledge that we're in a very different place than the other district that's here. Um, we have, I think, a little bit more schools. We have about 21 schools, K through eight. So it's, T, excuse me, preschool through eighth grade. Um, but what I've worked out with Tall is that when we pivot to hopefully bringing our kids back, you know, five days a week, um, however long that might be, is they would just pivot to doing um, after school 
care and, and support. And then that's another opportunity to collaborate and figure out, okay, how can we support the unfinished learning? What are the things that we can do with them in the classroom? And something that was said earlier that I think is really uh, crucial is understanding, I think, COVID has given an opportunity for service providers or out of school time providers to understand more about maybe what's going in the classroom and what students are, are, are uh, needing to learn and haven't yet learned. And so uh, there's a different view on how they can support them in the after school environment. And so we're gonna be partnering with Newton to figure out what that would look like um, when pressing our fingers, we bring most of our kids back every day because right now we're only uh, two days a week. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're there mainly during the day, but we would pivot, like I had said, to doing more of a traditional um, after school model with a heightened focus on what do we need to do to partner with Newton so that they can support in unfinished learning. Ellen, any, any what's your district plans? Um, as everyone ex has experienced here, the plans are always emerging and changing and going through multiple iterations. But at this point, we are in an A week and B week model. Um, we're going through the process of looking at if and when we can return our students back to school um, every day, given the three feet distancing. Um, but going through that process and talking to multiple stakeholders. So we have a very important board meeting this Thursday to look at that. Um, and I look forward to continuing to work with Newton um, over the summer. We will have summer school during the month of July for our students, but thinking about even that time in June um, and also August, what that might look like for our students so that we can provide them with more learning opportunities and also just time to be with peers own age to play and run around and, um, you know, play games on the playground and have make believe and pretend and be in the sandbox together so kids can have that joyful experience of socializing with each other as well. So that's also something I wanted to say that is a testament to Newton is not only were they helping kids with academics, but also they provide games and activities and enrichment so that it's more of a whole child approach. It's not just all about the academics. That's wonderful. Um, I don't know if anybody from the audience has a question. You can feel free to put it in the chat. I know I've got one last question for you all, and that is around uh, the mental health of our children and families, um, especially as we all come back. I think we're going to see a variety of different challenges uh, throughout all of our classrooms and in a variety of ways. So um, I'd love to start with Floor and just what you're seeing, how you see it between the school district and the uh, Newton and um, anything really from your perspective to look at as we go into the spring and summer. About the, the families and the frustra frustration that they've been living in this whole time. Uh, we still have students that ha we haven't been able to bring them back. There are other students that are in distance learning, full full time distance learning, that don't have this uh, connection. So um, I have heard from some parents that they are done with this and they want they want them to get out to go play to go with friends because. The, the kids are asking, why don't we go? Why can't I go to school? Because they're in this program, because we, we have the two programs, the hybrid program and the distance learning. Um, so looking forward to the summer and having um, to continue with uh, the these programs like Newton that we have and looking forward to the summer program that our district is going to offer a project-based learning um, to all students that want to participate um, half day, um, just to bring them back and have um, this after school programs to offer um, this enrichment that um, Newton has offered till now. So it's it's been great and the parents are looking forward. They're really happy because we're going to have it to open to all, not just to invite, not just like, um, uh, per invitation, like summer school, regular summer school that um, they're only for certain students. So um, 
we're look, looking forward to that and um and uh, um they're like can't wait to see that their kids are like going out to school and coming back on the bus and we can have them on the bus we can provide transportation because last year we couldn't provide transportation and for that reason a lot of our parents didn't couldn't send them to summer school so um good that and we have to keep it this way that um the distancing is is changing and and the rules are changing too so yeah Ellen, oh, oh sorry go ahead ellen did you want to go sure um as as far as my perspective on mental health and um what our families and experience experiencing is that I feel like a silver lining of all this is just the tremendous gratitude we have for each other and for the community partnerships that we have. So during this time, I have never received so many thank you emails and people trying to give you a hug from six feet away because they're giving you their child to come to school and their child can come to Newton and then the, their parents can focus on work and everything they're doing. So um, during this really challenging time when there's been so much stress, I also feel like people have a newfound appreciation for each other and for the members of our community and how it it takes a village and it takes a lot of love and it takes a lot of people um, behind the scenes to pull all these pieces together so that we can raise our children together. So just wanted to end it on a silver lining and positive note in regards to mental health as we're coming out of this pandemic together and being vaccinated um, that there's definitely bright, brighter skies ahead of us. Thank you. I I don't know how to, I can sort of add on to that, but because um, that's a really good way to end it. But I was just going to say something else that Newton does is um, really make sure to meet the children where they are and the different needs. And because the way that their system is set up, that we are able, the um, teachers in the classroom are able, or the Newton staff in the classroom is able to coordinate directly with the families and also coordinate directly with the teachers. And I think there was a question about how did the teachers respond? Um, the teachers are really happy that they were able to connect with somebody almost immediately. Immediately. It goes back to um, how Tal and his team have set up the systems. And I think it was mentioned that there's an email that goes directly to the staff. There's it's in the classroom. There's a phone number that's directly connected so that people can connect at all times. And then so something that I would just add is um, I was contacted about uh, some students that may maybe needed some additional supports. And so I shared with Tall and his team that we do mindfulness here at Foster City School. And so just sharing resources with him and having him understand more about what we do from a programmatic standpoint, so that when the students are in the classroom, it's 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 uh, almost like the same environment and the same language is being used and it's consistent so that it can be reinforced with what we wanna do with our students. And so that was just an example of, of mindfulness. And I would just say that also, um, you know, kids are really resilient. I mean, I definitely think that there are some definitely negative things that have happened due to the, the dual pandemics that are happening. But what I will say is that as a little anecdote is today, I got to, I said to some of the kids that they could go on the play structure because they haven't been able to go on the play structure. We just came back to school. We're learning new routines. And they were so excited. Like all I had to do was like, all right, go play on the play structure. And they were so happy and they followed the safety protocols. They wore their masks. But I think it's little things like that, that um, as an adult, just taking a step back and knowing that the little things make a difference for them. And it's in partnership, um, as Ellen has said, with all the, the outside service providers as well. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. One thing that I'm also thinking about is we hear this term learning loss a lot. And I think it's hard as an educator and a person that's been working so hard behind the scenes to make sure there's not a loss. And I, I hope we start thinking about also in terms of learning gains and how our kids have grown so much. They've learned how to follow schedules. They've learned how to tell time faster because they have to get on a Zoom call. Um, they've learned how to appreciate each other more and respect boundaries and bubbles because we have to be six feet apart. So. Um, it's something that I think educators are becoming more sensitive to is this constant idea and terminology around learning loss. And so I love thinking about learning gains and how we can thinking about learning and extended learning opportunities for our kids uh, in the spring and the summer and next year. 
Well, Floor, Ellen, and Amanda, thank you all so much. Um, your words of wisdom, I think, were uh, very valuable today, and we all have a wonderful reason to be grateful for our community partners. And with that, I pass it back to Petra for the rest of the program. Thank you. Um, I just want to give a shout out to Tal Tamir, who's here from Newton. You want to wave and say hi? Do you say anything you want to add? Because we kind of put you in an awkward position where we had all of these people talking about you and you're actually sitting in the room. No, nothing, nothing too much more to add. I think everybody shared um, the main points of what worked and um, how it worked out. And um, we've enjoyed the relationships with the district. It's um, come a long way in both districts. And I think um, it's been a positive experience for us as well. And um, we're happy to see the children finally get to go back to school. Um, so we look forward to that as well. Great. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for the connection so that we could have just an example of a, of a local success story. I think what Nancy said when she said that there are examples in small places of success. And she talked about Puente. We obviously have you as an example as well. Um, and that is something that we would love to expand upon. And that's a lot of the purpose of this peer learning series was to find out what's working and how do we expand it. And I think um, Nancy really put it out there kind of to us, like, hey, she would love to do something. What do we want to do? So I think we have a lot to talk about, about that. Um, we will continue this peer learning series. We have another one in a month. Um, and it feels like this is really, should be kind of a central focus. How do we make this work better? Um, if anybody wants to kind of put in a, some thoughts in the chat about that, that would be terrific. We had anticipated doing breakout rooms, but we actually had some things go over. And I think it was really important to give um, Nancy the time to express her support for this. And so we're going to continue to have this conversation. Um, I'd like to, before we, before I hand it over to Ashley, there are a couple of things I just want to talk about that I think were real highlights from today. So first of all, Nancy's willingness to move this forward. Marin Partnership obviously has a fantastic model and it sounds like that she's wants to see what we can do to emulate that. And we have a lot of uh, discussions about what parts of those would apply to our county. Um, I love what uh, the educators we just had talked about learning gains, how much the kids have learned from this that was not maybe what we anticipated and how much gratitude we now have. So I love those positive things. And with that, I would like to introduce um, Ashley Hunter from FitKids who has been doing some special programs during this time. Um, FitKids' mission is to provide structured, structured physical um, activity educations for underserved children. And during this time, they've pivoted, as we all have, and created some great new programs um, that are available to all of you. So uh, with that, Ashley, go ahead. Thanks, Patra. It's nice to meet you all. I see some familiar faces. It's nice to see you guys. And I just am going to take a few minutes to tell you a little bit about Fit Kids. For 10 years, we've been providing structured physical activity programs to kids at schools and community organizations. I see Petra on this call, and she was actually one of the first people I worked with 10 years ago when she was at the Boys and Girls Club. So we've come a long way since then, and the last year has definitely proven challenging for us. But um, rather than sit and wait for everybody to be back in school, we started developing videos, and over the over the last sort of nine months, we've put together over 170 videos that our partners are using to help their students stay active this year. And we have partners, everything from schools, after school organizations, youth sports organizations, camps, gyms, you name it, anybody working with kids has been reaching out to us over the past year looking for ways to keep their kids moving. And as a mom of four, um, I can tell you it is challenging, but especially the past year where they're sitting all day for school and not having the benefit of being on campus where they're moving from class to class or to recess 
um, or sports after school. It's been for me personally, painfully, you're watching my kids just sit way too much. So I'm so excited at Fit Kids that we have a way to help kids stay active. And I'm gonna share my screen and show you guys a little sneak peek of what our partners get. Um, this is our website. This is the free workout video page. So you can always come here to check out some of our videos. They're available to anybody and you can fill out program applications or request more information here. Once you're a partner and it's a really simple process to go through um, becoming a Fit Kids partner, you have access to our in-person curriculum. And the best part is all kids get access to all of our videos. So they're available to kids 24 seven at home on the weekends as homework, which we do have some schools that assign videos uh, to kids on the weekends. Kids get a password to log in and then they have access to all of our content. These are body weight workout videos. We designed our videos for the kids that we work with, which are generally lower income kids who don't have big backyards or really any space to be exercising or doing workouts. They also don't have a lot of equipment. So our activities are all body weight. Um, we have a how-to video series here that shows how to do certain fitness movements in 20 to 30 seconds. And because we've all been sitting for an hour and a half now, I'm gonna play one video and tell us all we're gonna do this. It's 20 right, seconds, so, so hang in there with me. how to do air drumming. So this upper body warm up will help you loosen up your muscles in your wrists and your hands. So you're gonna get in an athletic position, slight knee bend, make some light fists and bring your hands up and down like you're beating some drums or you got some ropes and you're whipping them as fast as you can. All right, you are ready to go. Complete this warm up for 30 seconds before you start your upper body fitness movements. And I'll see you soon. Hi, I'm Sergio, your Fit Kids So trainer. this is just a way for kids to get quick, quick 30 seconds of physical activity. And we have a lot of classroom teachers who are playing these videos now during the school day to take breaks during long Zoom sessions. And the best part is some of these yoga poses and mindfulness, which again, speaking of some of the mental health impact of sitting around all day and being on Zoom, I see it in my own kids, um, really good for everybody, adults included, to take breaks and do some of these quick videos. Um, we also have calendars and suggested workouts kids can follow along to. And for anybody who's able to be back in person, uh, we do have a whole in-person curriculum. Be happy to show you guys what that lo looks like. Um, but in the interest of time, I will also say that kids who are part of Fit Kids also have access to our app. This is free in the app store. You do need a password to access the content, but we built the app this year to make sure that all kids, including the kids who don't have Wi-Fi or computers, can access our videos. Generally, parents have um, smartphones where they can download this app and kids can watch the videos. So we wanted to make sure that all of the kids we're working with and we do have over 25,000 kids this year in our programs. That's at, like I said, partners, which are schools, after school organizations, anybody working with kids all around the Bay Area, Los Angeles, and then sort of sprinkled around the country. Um, so we are <clears throat> looking for more partners. If you want more information, please feel free to reach out to me. You can easily get there through our website. Um, and just because I think I have one more minute, Schools that are, or after school organizations that are partners have access to our in-person program. And now that people are starting to get back to in-person programming, they are able to access our curriculum, um, which looks like this. This is a quick, quick look at what everybody has. This is also about to be in an app. Um, it's an hour of physical activity, which is broken into small sections of time in case you don't have an hour and they're fun games fitness movements pe games yoga stretching that helps kids develop some specific fitness skills that we're trying to to build this one is a core class um, but it's also just really fun and helps kids learn to love being active which was the goal of fit kids so i'd be happy to answer any questions or again feel free to email me um, you can find me on the website or i'm just ashley at fitkids.org Ashley, thank you so much. Um, so first of all, 
for all of the resources today, we are going to send them out afterwards to everybody who registered. So you will have access to everyone's slides and we will send you Ashley's contact information and the website and everything. Um, there is one question for you, Ashley, which is how is Fit Kids funded? We are a nonprofit, so we work 24 seven raising money from individuals, from corporate sponsorships, family foundations, up until COVID, we did have one big event each year that raised a lot of money for us. Um, so we're kind of always on the hunt for new sources of funding, but we, we raise that money and then we turn around and we give fit kids for free everywhere we can. Um, we do qualify schools based on the percentage of kids on free and reduced cost lunch. And if you don't meet that minimum for us, then there is a fee for fit kids, but um, there's lots of ways that we can help you fundraise if you don't have the funds to purchase our program. Great, and I think many of the people on this call would qualify. So thank you so much, Ashley, for taking the time um, to show us. So the last thing I wanna close with is first of all, just a thank you to all the speakers and everyone who was here because this was a very packed agenda, but I think we really hit some important points. Um, our next uh, event in the series is on the 11th of May, um, two o'clock, not 2.30 uh, for the next one.